This is it, another VFET amplifier review. A pre-amplifier, to be more precise, the only VFET pre-amplifier ever built and supposedly one of the best preamps, full stop. These preamps are rather rare and can get quite pricey, even the pieces that don't work or the ones listed on eBay as not tested, which is a code name for tested and not working most of the time. This one was listed as not working and cost me about 1500 quid, which is quite a lot for something that's not actually working. But I took a leap of faith and bought her anyway, wishing the VFA transistors are right. Luckily, there was just something wrong with the power supply, which has been repaired, and to be sure it's gonna last at least next 50 years, or I've got it completely restored to its former glory. The most important part of this preamp are, of course, the VFA transistors. The problem is, the transistors used in this preamp were made exclusively for this preamp alone. They are no longer produced, and if some of them were to blow up, it would be a bloody pricey repair. Now, I'm about to repeat myself, so if you watched some of my previous VFET reviews, you can skip this bit. VFET or SIT or PowerFET transistors were developed by this bloke, Nishizawa Junichi, known as Mr. Semiconductor, and rightly so. Not only he was pretty good at his job, he was so obsessed with his work, he was actually thinking about naming his son after a transistor. Honours in being Japanese, there were only Japanese companies utilizing VFET in their product. Yamaha, Victor, known as JVC outside of Japan, Sansui, Sony and Hitachi. Unlike Yamaha, JVC and Sansui, Hitachi and Sony also produced integrated amplifiers with the VFET transistors. VFET have got very low noise, very low distortion and short turn on and turn off times. They say the VFET is as close to triodes as transistor will get. And from what I've heard so far, it's true. These transistors produce warm and sweet sound, but unlike the Velvams, the sound is also crystal clear and detailed. I hate to repeat myself, but these really are one of the best amps, full stop. Either in your world, you can hardly find anything better than the VFET. The production ran only for a couple of years before everybody turned their backs on the VFET and started using much cheaper and easier to work with MOSFETs and BJTs. The VFET can get quite odd compared to other transistors and need very precise and flawless power supply, otherwise they may quite easily end up dead. There are basically two types of amplifiers, power amps and preamps. Power amps take care of the amplification of the signal, while the preamps are there for volume and tone control, additional inputs and outputs on slide signal preamplification. You may have heard saying, there's no preamp like no preamp, and I always thought so too. Up till now, I've been using this Sony TAE A8 connected to my Yamaha B3s, and the sound is exactly the same with or without the preamp. I wonder if that's gonna be the case with the C1 as well. Surely there are crappy preamps that cook up the sound, there are also good preamps that don't worsen the sound such as the TAE A8, and there are supposed to be brilliant preamps that even make the sound better in terms of soundstage or whatever. And since the C1 is supposed to be one of the best preamps there is, I hope she's gonna prove that saying wrong. Yamaha is one of the first companies that utilized VFA transistors in their products. On the only company, they use the VFA transistors in the preamp. Yamaha is certainly proud of the C1, they even put it on the history page of their website. The C1 was released in 1975 to be paired with a power amp sister, the B1, which was released a year earlier. Unfortunately, I haven't got the B1, yet, so I can't test this monster combo. The C1 was Yamaha's top-of-the-line preamp and cost 400,000 yen, which is about 10,000 US dollars in today's currency, and if you paired her with the B1, which cost about the same, you could have had a very nice second-hand car instead. You can't... you can't not love her, just look at her, she's absolutely stunning. Oh, in the silver finish? Bloody hell! Yamaha made the silver finish version in very limited numbers and only for chosen markets. Nevertheless, I switched my black version for the silver one any time. I know it's a stupid rectangle, but the buttons, knobs, power meters and all the writings make it utterly gorgeous. And if you pair her with a B1 sister, it's a couple to die for. The C1 is chock a block with electronics, knobs, switches and buttons and she's probably the only Yamaha's preamp with power meters. As she was made in the 70s, the backlight is made of a simple small light bulb placed above the meters. I fancy it's had more than today's LED backlight. 
Speaking of LEDs, these light up when you turn on some of these switches. It's a nice touch. Like this, you know right away if some tone controls are used or not. She's not too heavy, she weighs 38 pounds, which, which is about 17 kilos, unlike the B1, which weighs 3 times as much. Every bit of this preamp is well built. All switches and buttons click like new, at least it feels like it. Knobs turn firmly, nothing wiggles or rattles or feels knackered. View meters still work perfectly fine, and the entire chassis feels firm, solid and tough. Yamaha did a cracking job on this one for sure. The power switch turns on the amp, obviously, it lights up the power meters, and after you hear the familiar relay click, you can start using the preamp. The meter switch controls the power meters, whether they display what's coming out of the preamp or what's going in the rack terminals. Here you can choose which PL terminal to use. Mode switches control channels, either stereo, mono, reverse, etc. 9 modes in total. Tone circuit enables tone control and tone equalizer functions. Here you can control bass, treble, acoustic, presence and turnover frequencies. I never used these features myself, but for the sake of this review, I had to test it of course, and found out the differences are very subtle. If you fancy over bass or over trebled music, you won't get it using the C1. The volume knob is pretty much self-explanatory there is. Another feature that needs tone circuit to be enabled is loudness. Yamaha recommends in the manual to set the volume to normal listening levels, and if needed, reduce the level using loudness rather than the volume knob itself. Using the volume lowers the volume level, but the loudness behaves a little bit differently. When it's all the way to the right, frequency response is flat. Turning the knob left lowers the mid frequencies the most, while keeping the heights and the lows at high levels. The balance knob is placed around the loudness knob and I quite fancy how it's designed. The audio muting switch either cuts off the output completely or lowers it by 20 dB. Input selector switch, besides the usual inputs, has got one interesting feature. Using the test position is for generating a couple of test frequencies to test various components, which is then controlled by the OSC knob. What is a tad disappointing though, is that the phono stage is just for MM cartridges, so if you want to listen to an MC cartridge, you need to get an additional adamp. On the flip side, if you've got MM cartridges, you can connect up to 3 turntables, and you've got quite large and precise options for adjusting impedance. Next one is not exactly a feature, it may be useful though. She runs so bloody hot, it's excellent for winter times, you don't need any heaters, but in the summer, it may be a bit of a problem for both, you on the amp. The hottest bit is here, where the vents are obviously. The temperature is of course even higher inside. This is the bit where the vents are. As I said before, she's littered with electronics, there are tons of PCBs, some moving parts and other odds and sorts. I saw her completely taken apart, and as you can see, the chassis is not exactly empty. I took this video out of the iFi Squirrel channel, he made a complete restoration video, so if you're interested how she looks inside, check out his channel, it's in the description. There are tons of input terminals, free phono inputs, tuner, two auxiliary and three tape inputs, that's more than enough for most people. Tuner, auxiliary and tape inputs are practically the same thing, it doesn't matter where you put your DAC, tape DAC or reel to reel DAC. Pre-out is of course output leading to the power amp. With meter input, you can use power meters to measure an external source instead of the signal coming into the normal input terminals. Level adjust knobs are there for adjusting the level of the signal from all these sources. This bit is for connecting an external equipment for testing purposes, using the internal oscillator as I showed before. With this connector you can connect the C1 on the B1 together with a special cable. You can then turn on and off the B1 by turning on and off the C1, nothing else. 
I played around with her for about a fortnight to find out if she's actually worth it. I don't know what I expected, but to be perfectly honest, I actually got a better sound. Sure, it can be a placebo to justify a very steep price of these devices, but I believe I actually heard the difference. I tested the preamp on two very different systems, mine and my mate's. My setup is two Yamaha B3s in BTL mode powering two Infinity Carp or 9.2 speakers, and my mate's setup is Acuface A65 on some custom made loudspeakers. I don't want to spew some audio file rubbish, but the C1 enhanced the sound in two ways. A better instrument separation, and better and more pronounced details. Since I wasn't sure if it's just my imagination or not, I had my mate come over and listen to the C1 and made him assess the sound if he can hear any difference whatsoever. On his assessment was very similar to mine, we agreed on that. The last thing I've noticed after these 14 days is that the sound is somehow less tiring. Don't get me wrong, the sound that's coming out of the B3 is nearly perfect, it's not tiring at all, but after I connected them to the C1, it made it somehow even less so. The sound seems a bit softer, like it's caressing your eardrums. If you want to use an MM cartridge, the C1 does an outstanding job getting the best possible sound out of the cartridge. Preamps in general increase gain, and thus they slightly increase noise flow, so I was wondering how much noise the C1 adds to the signal. This is the ADC's noise floor. I don't know what the spike is, but it's not important for this test. And this is the C1's noise floor. It adds about 10 dB across the frequency board. Human hearing threshold is about minus 115 dB, so any noise that's coming out of the C1 is inaudible, even though this looks more like a distortion than a noise. Yamaha aimed quite high, they wanted to create the best solid state amp combo, and it seems like they did a bloody good job creating these beasts. Unfortunately, the B1 I've got is the transistors burned, so I can't test her yet. But I've got the C1 connected to my B3s, which are simply astonishing piece of hardware. So if this is one of the best preamps there is, is she worth the money? I've bought mine for 1500 quid, which is a bloody good price for a working piece, even though she was advertised as not working, plus another 500 for the restoration. You can find working C1 for 5000 US dollars online, which is not exactly cheap. She makes the sound undoubtedly better, it's subtle, it's not like 5 levels better, but it's there. The supposedly best preamp for £2,000 is a steal, considering you can also get second-hand Ecoface C3900 for about £18,000. I haven't heard, let alone tested, the C3900, but considering the price and that the C1 is considered one of the best preamps, why would anybody buy that overpriced crap? When I AB compared my B3s to top Ecoface power amps A65 and P7100, the B3s were just better, and that makes me believe the C1 is better as well. Nevertheless, I've compared the C1 to my Sony TAE88, and the C1 is surely better in terms of sound quality and features. Sony wasn't bad. She added some controls and inputs for the various audio equipment, but what's more important, she didn't degrade the sound in any way, but also didn't announce it the way the C1 did. If I had to pay 5000 US dollars for this, or any preamp for the matter, I'd totally skip it. The price, the, the price is bollocks for what the preamp does. I'm not sure if this kind of difference in sound justifies the high price, but I'm keeping it anyway, at least until I find something better if something better exists, of course. Perhaps upgrading your power amp, deck or tree in your room would be a better choice. However, if you believe that all your equipment is top of the line and you can't upgrade anything anymore and you don't care about the price, the C1 is the way to go. On the C for today, see you lot in the comments and if you're interested, you can read through the specs.